Good morning uh, or good day to everyone who is, has joined us, wherever you may be. My name is Gregory Ormsfeet Mori, and this is the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. We're about to get started. Our presentation today is by Jim Allen at Northern Arizona University. Oops, we've got some folks on the line. I'm going to ask you to mute your microphones, please. And uh, we're just about to get started here. Uh, again, this is the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. It's a production of the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. My name is Gregory Ormsby Mori. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Center. We hold these uh, webinars about monthly and uh, each, each time have a new and compelling topic on some agroforestry related theme both in the United States and uh, sometimes from around the world. Again, today's presentation is by uh, Dr. James Allen. Uh, Jim is a professor and the executive director at the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University. Prior to his arrival at uh, Northern Arizona University in 2006, he served for six years as the Dean of Forestry at, uh, Dean of the Forestry Division at Paul Smith College. And he also worked for almost 10 years as a research ecologist and forester for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services in Louisiana, and for four years as a research ecologist forester for the U.S. Forest Service in Hawaii. In both cases, specializing in the ecology, management, and restoration of forested wetlands. Uh, Jim has had a, a keen interest in agroforestry as well, and he's been active in both uh, for agroforestry research and promotion for many years. Uh, he's, he's worked with us. Uh, for someone who has their mic on, let's mute that, please. Thank you. Um, Jim has uh, been active in agroforestry. He's worked with us in the Agroforestry Association's promotion of, of agroforestry. Uh, recently has been involved with the creation of a new working group in the American Southwest on agroforestry. And he's conducted some research in um, both native stewardship and native uh, practices uh, and some relation to agroforestry. And has also been working on food forests in the American Southwest. And that's the topic we're gonna hear about today. The title of the presentation is Food Forests in the American Southwest, a Growing Agroforestry Practice. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Jim. Jim, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Gregory. Excellent. Uh, please take it away. I'm going to mute my mic. I should mention to the participants that the presentation will run for about 40 or 45 minutes, and after that, we'll have some time for some Q&A. Please, Jim, take it away. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, for the invitation. And thank you all who are listening in today. I really appreciate your spending time with me. So let's, let's start by looking at the title, Food Forests in the American Southwest. I am gonna speak largely about examples here in this region. I think a lot of what I have to say has a little more general applicability as well. And then the subtitle, a Growing Agroforestry Practice. Of course, food forests, agroforestry in general is about growing things. But the reason I chose that subtitle was because I really think there's a growing interest and a growing number of food forests in the Southwest as well as nationally and internationally. So that's the reason for the title. As a professor, I always like to start lectures with an outline where I'm going with the lecture and I'm going to do that again here. So I'm going to start by giving you some background on food forests. I don't know for sure what your, own, your backgrounds are, uh, it's going to be relatively brief, but I want to set the stage so that we understand we're all on the same page roughly. The bulk of the time will be spent going over some examples of food forests in various southwestern settings. I'll give you one example of one that's at a high elevation and a relatively rural location. I'll spend a fair amount of time talking about urban and suburban examples, and then talk a little bit about um, agroforestry food forests on the reservations, because I think that's where a lot of potential might lie. And then towards the end, I'll wrap it up with some discussion about local networks that are promoting food forests and agroforestry in this region, what I think are some of the research needs and some broader conclusions. Scattered throughout, there'll be references to additional resources. Some of those will be books, some of those will be videos, things, and they'll just be scattered here and there. I'll highlight them as I go through. 
I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Andy Mason. Andy, I think some of you know, Andy was the director of the National Agroforestry Center until he retired and moved to the Southwest. He now lives in the appropriately named Carefree, Arizona. And he and I have made many of the visits that I'm gonna be talking about, the sites that we've, um, that I'll highlight or some that he and I have been to together. In this picture with Andy is Kathleen Merrigan, who at the time was the Deputy Undersecretary of Agriculture. And this was at an event unveiling the first strategic framework on agroforestry. Uh, so I don't see Andy too often wearing a suit like that anymore now that he's retired, but I just want to acknowledge Andy as my co-collaborator on a lot of this work. So let's start with what is a food forest? Um, Here's probably the most simple definition I can come up with, and I'll come and I'll explain this in a second a little further. But it's a multi-layered planting of mostly perennial species, of course, with trees and other woody plants being a key part of it. Food forests go by other kinds of names. Forest garden is a really common name, edible forest garden, agroforest, and particularly in other countries, home garden. To me, these are all the same. I, I consider them synonyms uh, for the same thing. Some people would differentiate them a little more finely, and I'll, and I'll discuss that briefly as well. But to me, these are all synonyms. I'm treating them more or less the same for this presentation. So one thing that distinguishes sort of an idealized food forest is these multiple layers. And in some treatments, you'll see discussion about seven layers. There'll be a canopy layer with larger trees. In this image, it shows them as being large fruit trees or nut trees. In some cases, they could be timber trees as well or nitrogen fixing trees. You may have a lower tree level, sort of mid-story level. And in food forests, that's typically consisting of fruit trees. Often there's a shrub layer that might have things like you see there, currants and berries. A herbaceous layer, and here's some examples, comfries, beets, herbs, many, many possibilities there. There could be root vegetables of various types. There could be soil surface cover plants. Strawberry is the example you see there. And quite often there's a climbing layer, vines and climbers. So those are seven layers that are often associated with sort of an idealized, fully developed food forest. So one question is, if you look at an image like this, is this a food forest? This is a small front yard in, in the Phoenix area. You can see a fair amount of complexity in the vegetation. There are definitely some layers there. There's not a well-developed ground layer. At the moment, there's not vines. So I wouldn't say that it has all seven layers. It's not very big. And by some definitions, a food forest, as opposed to say a forest garden, would be bigger than you see here. But for my purposes, I'm going to treat even small things like this as a food forest. So why have food forests? Why, why the interest in food forests? Well, as you might imagine from the name, they're established primarily for food production. But quite often, I would say in most cases, there are other plants for other purposes. Medicinal plants, for example, are really common in food forests and plants for other purposes. Some of those other purposes might be soil enhancement, for example, nitrogen fixing or mulch producing kinds of species, species that, are, that attract pollinators that may in turn help pollinate fruit trees and other plants, food producing plants. In some cases, food forests produce wood. And I think of them as beautiful. I think the aesthetics can be quite impressive in food forests. And particularly here in the Southwest, I think a really important reason to have them, in addition to what I've already mentioned, is the climate amelioration value. We're in a hot, dry place. When you walk into a food forest, you notice the difference. It's much cooler, much more pleasant. To me, food forests are about health. They're about human health and environmental health. When I say human health, there's two, two elements to that at least. One is just the value of the food, the high quality of the food, the short distance from 
where it's produced to where it's consumed, the organic nature of it in many cases, healthy food, but also just the exercise, being outdoors, doing the physical work of planting and maintaining a food forest is also a healthful thing in my opinion. And then I think there's all kinds of environmental benefits. I've mentioned things like climate amelioration, carbon sequestration, biodiversity. I think there are many, many possible environmental benefits related to food forests. I can sense them when I walk into a really well-developed food forest. The ones I've seen down here, and I think in general, are rarely established primarily for commercial purposes. In some cases, there are products sold from these food forests, but for the most part, I consider them to be largely non-commercial or only semi-commercial enterprises. One of the early um, promoters of food forests was Robert Hart, who lived in England. And here's a quote from him that I think is very meaningful in the context of food forests. So it states, obviously, few of us are in a position to restore the forests, but tens of millions of us have gardens or access to open spaces, such as industrial wasteland, where trees can be planted and a full advantage can be taken of the potentialities that are available in heavily built up areas, new city forests can arise. Uh, he was very interested in food forests, uh, and I am as well, but there are other, applications, I think, uh, that you can look at based on this quote. But to me, there's huge, huge potential in the urban and suburban areas. There are millions of people who have a quarter acre, half acre, uh, enough to develop a really nice food forest. And I'd love to see many, many more than we see today. Here's the first example of some resources related to food forests. These are some of my favorite books on the topic. Uh, on the left, you see a, the first volume of a two-volume set called Edible Forest Gardens by David Jack and Eric Tonsmeyer. This is a really, really information-rich resource, this book, Edible Forest Gardens. And it's, it's not Southwest specific. None of these three that you see in front of you are, but it has a lot of relevance in the Southwest as well. Another kind of how-to book is the one on the far right, Creating a Forest Garden, Working with Nature to Grow Edible Crops by Martin Crawford. He lives in Southwest England. And again, it's really aimed more at that kind of environment. But there's a lot of useful information in that book, much of which I think is relevant in the Southwest as well. And then that book in the middle by Kathy Bukowski and John Monsell focuses on community forests. And again, it's a really, really nice, useful resource, particularly if you are focused more on the community rather than private food forests. Most of the examples I'm gonna talk about are private food forests, but um, community food forests are really important and there are some in this region as well. Another good res resource, but really more for agroforestry in general is this book that was published last year on temperate agroforestry systems. Frankly, I was a little disappointed in this book from the perspective of food forests. It was great for some of the other practices, but here's an example of a quote from that book that disappointed me a little bit. Home gardens, a tropical agroforestry type used to describe the diverse array of plants and trees found adjacent to dwellings is generally not considered an important form of temperate agroforestry. It's probably true, um, but I think that's changing. And, Hopefully that's one of the take home messages of this presentation is that it's changing and needs to change more quickly. I found this slide which lists the five temperate agroforestry practices that are most widely uh, promoted, alley cropping, silvopasture, pasture, forest farming, riparian buffers, and windbreaks. So one of my take home messages is that there should be a sixth one. I would like to see in future figures food forests added as a sixth temperate agroforestry practice. Certainly tropical home gardens, the tropical equivalent of food forests is a very widely recognized agroforestry practice. Okay, so let's move on to examples of food forests. And I'm gonna start with a rural food forest up in the central Colorado region. It's on the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute property, which is near Basalt, Colorado. 
The uh, institute is located at approximately 7,200 feet in an area with about 16 inches of rainfall. It's tucked into a beautiful little valley. Uh, challenging environment for a food forest. You can see over on the right uh, a lot of red soil. The soil here is not highly fertile. It's a lot of red clay soil, difficult, challenging soil to work with to some degree. In the lower foreground, you see some of the greenhouses. There's a mix on this property of greenhouses and an outdoor food forest. The founder of this is Jerome Ostentowski. He is one of the foremost leaders in terms of food forests in the United States. Uh, I had the privilege of spending four nights up there a couple of falls ago. It was a really a really fascinating time. Here's another aerial image of the property. You can see the greenhouses. You can see, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but th this is the home. It's got uh, solar panels. There's five greenhouses on the property. Here's one, here's another really big one, smaller one, another one, and then there's one up on the hill. Again, you can see there's a lot of bare looking soil. This is mostly pinon juniper forest and red clay soil. I've outlined the food forest, the outdoor part of the food forest here. And if you take a moment to look at that, you'll notice that the colors, the textures are very different than the surrounding pinyon juniper forest. There's a lot of different species here in this food forest. This food forest was de developed starting roughly in the mid 90s. The next two pictures are from two different locations. So picture one was taken on this deck here looking down into this part of the food forest, looking mostly at the canopy of it. And then picture two will be on a trail along this lower part of the food forest. Not the highest quality image, I apologize for that, but that's the best I have. This is looking down on the canopy of this food forest from a deck uh, above it, above a, a little bit of a depression, a lower part of the food forest. To me, this resembles a tropical rainforest canopy. You can see the complexity, you can see the different colors, you can see climbers, you can see that there's a, quite a few different species and levels here. Really complex um, canopy, complex forest structure here. Almost entirely artificial. There are some native trees, there's some big Douglas fir, there's gamble oak, there's some, some things that are scattered through here that are native. Uh, much of it is planted. If you get down on the uh, ground and start walking through some of the paths, this is what you see at, at ground level. So again, it's not the sharpest image, but over here you've got an apple tree. On this side, you've got a mulberry tree. You can see a really complex, densely planted understory. This clearly has many of the layers of an idealized food forest. It's a very, very well-developed, highly diverse food forest. Here's another image, um, a little bit more zoomed in of that particular spot. And I really wanted to highlight the understory in this case. So what you see, for example, on the right is a, a group of hollyhock. And these are multi-purpose plants that are good for pollinators, attracting pollinators. I think of them as aesthetically pleasing. They do have medicinal value as well. Many, many of the plants on this food, in this food forest are multi-purpose. Another example is the comfrey over on this side, which is used primarily by Jerome in a sort of a chop and drop mode where he will cut this and either lay it right down in place around some of the other trees as a mulch or um, to the houses for the similar purpose. And it does have medicinal values as well. It can be used medicinally. So comfrey is another example of a species you often see in food forests in this region and, and much further afield as well. Scattered through this food forest, which is used uh, for educational purposes, as well as food production and medicinal production, are some of these little signs. And I'll, let's, let's zoom in and look at one of these signs. It's not the same sign that you see here, but uh, a similar one just further down the trail. Here's what it looks like. So scattered, like I say, through the food forest, you'll find these signs that list the species planted, and it puts them in different categories. They, they may or may not match up exactly with those seven layers. In this case, I think there are more layers uh, showing up here than really listed, say back in that slide I showed you earlier. 
but it lists several overstory species, mostly fruit and nut species, a number of midstory species, a vining species, grapes, and a number of ground cover species. Some of them are highlighted as nitrogen fixing species like the Siberian pea shrub and um, things like mountain mahogany. There is an insectary species listed, in this case, garlic. There's an insect right there to kind of prove that insects are attracted to this site. Uh, there are 25 different species listed on this one sign, and there are probably more actually in this immediate location. This is kind of typical of small sections of uh, Jerome's food forest, each having 25, 30 species, and the sum total probably being well over 100. It's really a fascinating place, and, and Jerome offers some short courses and a, a more in a full permaculture design course. I highly recommend if you haven't had the chance to go see his place to go see it. There is no wasted space. I'm I'm, I'm not going to spend time on the indoor greenhouses, but that's an interesting story in its own right. This is a scene from the inside the tropical greenhouse where he can grow citrus and things through a Colorado winter. Even the, even the paths are used underneath here, or pallets, and underneath that is soil and uh, vermiculture operation. So he's producing red wigglers underneath his, his path through the greenhouse. Outside, almost all the space is used and used really, really well. Totally fascinating place. If you're interested in learning more, there is a video, there's a number of videos on the Crimpy, the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute website. This is a really new one here called Modeling Nature, What an Unlikely Food Oasis Can Teach Us in an Era of Climate Change. It's a beautifully filmed, relatively short video uh, about Jerome, and it has scenes from both indoors and outdoors. Jerome also published this book called The Forest Garden Greenhouse. It emphasizes more of the greenhouses, but does talk a little bit about the outdoor food forests as well. And then there's a really, really nicely filmed uh, video on Martin Crawford's food forest in Southern England. You can easily access this by just typing Nat Geo food forest or forest garden. It's about a five minute video, beautifully filmed, drone footage, ground level footage, interview with Martin, really, really nicely done video. These show some of the best developed food forests that I'm aware of anywhere in the world, in the temperate world. So I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about urban and suburban food forests. I think there's enormous potential here just in terms of the quantity of food forests possible. You're looking at a, a scene of Farmington, New Mexico, a Google Earth image. Farmington is in the northwest part of the state. It's at about 5,400 feet. It's very, very dry, 10 inches of rainfall. It is blessed with some rivers flowing through it though, and some people have access to the uh, ditch water, the Sakia water, which is helpful. In the middle of the scene is one of the best developed food forests I've been to to date. Zooming in on that scene, this is this, the uh, location of this food forest in a suburban neighborhood right up the hill from a highly developed part of Farmington, high traffic, semi-industrialized looking part of the town. So let's take a look, closer look at this food forest from ground level. Here's a couple scenes. It's hard to do justice to this food forest. This, this one really, really looks like a forest. It's got an overstory of native trees, many of which are not fruit trees. They are um, things like elms and hexberries, some, some native, some not native, like Siberian elm is pretty common here, not native. You got the hackberry, you've got locusts, cottonwood. It, it's really quite an impressive overstory, but with a lot of gaps. And in those gaps, you have fruit trees like you see here and here and here. Here's an apricot tree uh, in fruit. There's a list that the woman who has established this food forest has produced. And I'm showing you just the top part of that list. She, she breaks that list down by canopy layer, sub canopy layer, shrub layer, uh, herbaceous layer, ground cover. She's got all those layers listed. And I tallied up the number of species and varieties and it was just over 160 that she has planted on this roughly one acre food forest. Really, really impressive. Not all of them have survived, but it is a highly diverse 
forest. And it really does look like a forest when you walk through it. Here's just another scene. In this case, you're looking at Siberian elm overstory in a pretty complex mix of understory and midstory plants, some of which were volunteers, some of which were planted. But again, 160 planted species in this food forest. Beautiful greenhouse uh, is also on that same property. By the way, if I'm going too fast, type in slow down or something like that, I'll slow down a little bit. I want to focus a little more attention on urban food forests in the Phoenix and Tucson area. Here we're talking about some pretty challenging conditions, low elevation, true desert type environment. Tucson has about 11 inches of rainfall. Phoenix has about nine inches of rainfall, very dry places. And yet there are some beautiful food forests or forest gardens in this area. Probably the most well-known of those is the one called Longevity Gardens, which is highlighted here. Uh, it's, it's an older image, an older Google Earth image, and it's developed quite a bit since then. But even in this image, you can get a sense that it looks a whole lot different than uh, some of the surrounding properties. Much more uh, vegetated, uh, much more diverse in terms of the vegetation planted. The reason I say this is probably the most well-known one is because there are so many videos about it. Here's a couple examples. If you get on YouTube and type longevity gardens or food forest Phoenix or something like that, you'll find quite a few videos that highlight this particular food forest. I like this one because this guy, John Kohler, walks down the street and contrasts three houses. He contrasts one that has a very typical gravel lawn, the house next to it has fairly common grass lawn. And then you get to this property, which stands out so dramatically in that neighborhood and shows what is possible in a relatively small one third acre lot in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area of Tempe, technically. But the food force that I want to focus on a little more deeply is partly because it's a really interesting story that goes beyond a single property, um, partly because it's a little bit of a different model of a food forest, is the one down in Tucson in the area known as the Dunbar Spring neighborhood. Some of you may have heard of this gentleman, Brad Lancaster. Brad and his brother bought this house here, house and garage. This was what it looked like when they bought it in the 90s. And, uh, that, that part of the neighborhood has private property and then it has these really wide rights of way, which in most cases were barren, like you see there. People parked their cars on them, there was trash in them. They were very underutilized areas. Over the coming years after the 90s when they moved in, Brad and his brother started doing some plantings. And this is a scene of that same spot as it looks about oh seven or eight years ago i believe it's grown up even more since then they've converted that whole right away into plantings largely native plantings native sonoran desert plants but almost all of those are food producing plants even the mesquites and the ironwoods produce uh, edible pods you can make flour out of them you can eat the seeds of ironwood as edamame when they're ripe before they're ripe fully ripe it's amazing how much food you can produce from Sonoran desert plant. So to me, this is a great example of a couple things. Innovative water management, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, and a really great adoption story. And the reason I say that is because this is the scene in front of his property, but dozens and dozens of his neighbors have done the same thing. That entire neighborhood is being transformed. Uh, it's been transformed substantially already and that transformation is ongoing. It's really impressive. To me, this is a, partly a story about agroforestry and food forests, partly a story about urban forestry, partly a story about community development. It's really, really fascinating. Here's an example of the kind of transformation you see as you walk that neighborhood. Here's a property that's adopted the similar practices to what Brad and his brother have done. Here's a property where it looks like the old right away. Dramatic contrast. And when you walk in there and think about Tucson in the summer when it's 100, 110 degrees, when you walk from here to there, 
you understand climate amelioration value of a food forest or urban forestry more generally. In some cases, they don't necessarily have every single layer that a food forest would have, and they may not be as big, but when you add up the cumulative effect of this planting through the neighborhood, this sort of dispersed multi-block food forest, a lot of food is produced both on private holdings and in the rights of way. And the transformation in terms of aesthetics and climate is just remarkable. So I'm not, I'm not gonna get into depth unless people ask me questions about some of the more management and establishment practices, but I will give you a few quick examples here. Uh, one is this innovative water management that Brad and others are using in that neighborhood. Again, remember this is 11 inches of rainfall, city water is not cheap, and a, a lot of the plantings are irrigated the way you see here, by cuts in the curb or by core holes in the curb that lead into these infiltration basins in the right-of-way, sometimes with connections that go into yards or other parts of the right-of-way. And um, when you get a monsoon rain, instead of a lot of that water running down the street and into the nearest storm drain, it fills up these basins and infiltrates. And in a lot of cases, that's the only irrigation, especially after the plants are established, that is used. Rainfall running down the street and going into these infiltration basins creating um, a resource out of waste, as Brad likes to say. Water that would be running down storm drains that might need to be treated, now goes into infiltration basins and grows plants. One thing is noticeable when you walk through the neighborhood, there's a lot of new ones here. There's ongoing adoption. There's older ones that are well-established with trees 15, 20 feet tall, and then there are brand new ones that are just being planted. So this is an ongoing story. The infiltration basins are full of mulch. Some of it's put in there to start and then prunings and things are, are dropped in there afterwards. Again, we're in, we're in the dry southwest. How do you water these food forests? It, the story varies depending on where you are. Some people are fortunate to actually have water rights and even flood irrigation. Here's a neighborhood in Phoenix that used to be an old citrus orchard. And now the properties all have water rights and can periodically flood their whole property. So here's an example where the front yard looks like a normal yard for the most part, but this whole thing can be flooded up to a depth of a few inches. And you see a brick missing here. That's because when the water comes up, it goes through here and irrigates this fruit tree. Same with some gaps over in this part of the garden. So some people are fortunate to have flood irrigation, ditch water, things like that. Other people collect rainwater in cisterns or even buckets. You see this line of buckets where this gentleman has no gutter, so he collects water that way. So people are quite resourceful. There are swales, micro swales on this property that is flat, but still has some really small swales to hold water back. Some really innovative water practices, water management. Brad Lancaster has a two volume set that I think is well worth getting if you're going to do a food forest in this region or other agroforestry practices. He just came out with new editions of these two volumes set, rainwater harvesting. First volume is guiding principles. The second one has more to do with water harvesting earthworks, swales and things like that, infiltration basin. Again, a really, really useful, relatively affordable resource. Another thing you see commonly in this region, probably in other regions as well, is the use of wood chips. Uh, one of the food forests I visited, for example, uses them quite extensively over the top of a compacted soil or clay soil layer. And just very, very frequently you see the use of wood chips and landscaping waste in this region. One thing I wasn't aware of until I started doing these visits is that you can sign up, there's an app, just like there's an app for everything else. There's an app where you can sign up and get free wood chips dropped in your property. And people in the Phoenix area, at least, are taking advantage of that. So if you're interested, Google chip drop and you'll find uh, information on that app. You can sign up and get periodic drops of wood chips on your property, whole truckloads of them. And there's some pretty interesting innovative practices when you get out and start looking at these places. For example, one of the properties in Phoenix has what I'm calling a mulberry chicken silvo pasture. That's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but 
inside his chicken pen, he's got a pretty sizable mulberry tree that he topped here. And the branches now spread out below the uh, wire fencing on the roof of this chicken coop. And so they spread out. And so he can go in there. This is Greg Peterson, uh, pretty well known in the Phoenix area. And you can eat, he can just harvest mulberries himself directly from the tree, or he can let those mulberries drop and the chickens will harvest them for him. It's also providing shade for the chickens in that coop. So it's just kind of an innovative micro scale practice, agroforestry type practice. So I'm gonna switch gears now and um, talk about food forests on the reservation. This is what got me interested in food forests in this region originally, and I've branched out more to urban areas. And the reason I say that is because when I worked in the Peace Corps in Southern Africa, I saw and I worked with farmers that had this sort of dispersed pattern, much like you see on the Navajo reservation. And I started to see potential parallels uh, with the reservations and where I'd worked in Africa. So I think there's a lot of reasons to focus some of our attention on the reservations. First of all, they occupy a lot of land in this region. All these areas that are colored this sort of brownish color are reservations. Quite a bit of the states of Arizona, big chunks of northern Mexico, New Mexico are reservation land. It's a lot of people. Some of the biggest tribes in the country are based here, like the Navajo tribe. And yet there are many challenges they face, that high poverty rate, high incidence of dis diabetes and other health-related issues. But at the same time, these are people that have close ties to the land. They have a history of agriculture and agricultural adaptation. And there's very, very little research to date on um, this work. I've been trying to find out, and I, I will ask you if any of you know of uh, traditional practices that are sort of analogous to the types of food forests I've been talking about, where you have multiple species, multiple layers. So far, the closest thing I've found is this really intriguing chapter in a book, and the chapter was called The Berry Gardens of Karai and the Pocket Terraces of Abo. And here's a quote. There is nothing quite like the fruit and berry gardens they established in their little valley anywhere else in the Pueblo world of the 80, 1300s to 1400. I've found relatively little current practice that I would consider a really dense multi-species, multi-layer food forest. There's certainly a strong tradition of agriculture. There's some beautiful orchards, for example, but I'm still looking for examples like this today. And if any of you know of them, by all means, please let me know. When I drive the reservation myself, I see a mix of properties. I see some where there's been a lot of tree planting, like this one here in the upper left clearly shows it can be done. More typically, you'll see two or three trees, maybe no trees at all. But when I look at properties like this, I see that there is potential that certainly people do have the ability and in some cases the interest to plant trees and have them be successful on very difficult soils, very difficult uh, situations with water limitation, etc. Here's a closer up image of a house that doesn't have many trees, but the trees that they have planted, they have cared for. If you zoom in, you can see that they've protected. They have little basins around the one tree, a little protection around the other tree. They're investing some effort in protecting these trees and establishing them, probably more for shade than from fruit, for fruit based on what they look like. Siberian elm, it looks like a pine here. Um, but again, I see potential, a lot of, mostly unrealized potential, but potential nonetheless. A great example that's showing the potential really well is the Hopi Tutsqua Permaculture Institute, which is located in the village of Kakatsmovi, right across the street, which I think is really convenient from the tribal headquarters for the Hopi tribe. So this is their headquarters. This is the Hopi Tutsqua Permaculture Institute. Here's a closer image of it, an older image, doesn't do justice to what you see on the ground at all. I, went, I visited there a couple of years ago, and this is what I saw, a beautifully developing, still young, but developing food forest. It's got that complexity of different layers, fruit trees, there's a honey locust and things growing in the upper canopy or that will become the upper canopy. Quite a few understory species, uh, it's, it's really quite diverse 
And it's an impressive story as well, because again, this is very, very dry country. They're collecting rainwater and cisterns. You can see one here in the background and irrigating mostly with drip irrigation and with swales to hold rainfall back. Very, very innovative, very interesting work on their own property, but also the uh, couple that, that lead this institute are doing a lot of outreach. A lot of it's related to fruit trees. Some of it's about restoring older orchards that were established you know, decades ago and have been neglected. In other cases, they're re establishing new orchards and quite a bit of work with youth. It's really, really amazing what these folks are doing. Really impressive. And that extends to sustainable housing as well. That's getting a little off topic, but this is what one of the homes on their property looks like. Cobb construction. When I visited, it was about 95 degrees. And when I went inside, it was cool as can be. They have two greenhouses attached to two of the buildings and they were producing pretty, pretty well there um, in the late summer when I visited. So now I want to switch gears quickly and talk about some of the networks that are promoting food forests and kind of related work in the Southwest. These are resources you may find useful. A really interesting one to me is the um, LEAF Network based in Arizona, linking edible Arizona forests. If you get on their website, leafnetworkaz.org, or just type in LEAF Arizona, you'll easily find their website. It's really a very, very information rich website focusing mainly on different kinds of fruit trees you can grow in Arizona in different elevations, much of it which would be applicable throughout the Southwest. Other networks, I mentioned Greg Peterson, the guy who has, uh, I showed you the picture of his front yard. He runs an organization called Urban Farm U. They have a, another information rich website. They do podcasts and um, other kinds of training workshops on site. There's a permaculturalist over in uh, Mesa who owns a place called B Oasis, and he does periodic tours of that. Going back to Brad Lancaster and his work, uh, I would if, I would love for you all to go on to TED TED Talks, do a TED Talk search. Ted Brad Lancaster, or put in the full title, Planting the Rain to Grow Abundance. This is a really fascinating, about 18 minute TED talk that Brad did. Again, he has these books, Rainwater Harvesting. He is also part of a group called Desert Harvesters that's promoting the use of these Sonoran Desert plants for um, food purposes. And they've developed this pretty creative kind of fun book called Eat Mesquite and More cookbook, but it's really a lot more than a cookbook too. And it certainly would help promote an interest in food production and food forests by extension. The newest of the networking efforts in our region is the Southwest Agroforestry Action Network. And I want to put in a plug for this group. We have an email list. I'd be happy to sign you up for that. We also have had one in-person meeting and our second in-person meetings coming up in mid-March in Tucson. Among other things, we'll have Brad Lancaster there as both a keynote speaker and to give us a tour of his neighborhood. It's a three-day workshop, mainly over two days, and then more of a business meeting on the third day. So please keep this in mind. I can easily provide more information on this meeting. Um, we're getting close to getting a save the date message out more broadly. To begin to wrap up here, just quickly, I want to go through some research needs. I don't know how many of you who are listening are researchers. But to me, there are certain categories of research that I think are ripe in the Southwest. One is to, to learn more about who's doing what, to get out there and do more formal surveys. Andy Mason and I have been out visiting sites. We've taken a questionnaire with us, but it's only semi-formal. I think there's a great opportunity to get down on the ground and talk to these food forest practitioners and do surveys. What size, what are the management practices, what are the challenges? Um, there's a lot that can be done on the biophysical aspects of these food forests. How productive are they? Where's the water coming from? How much is being used? What are some of the soil related challenges which are quite significant in this region? What effects are food forests having on the soil? Are they storing carbon, for example? And I can guarantee you they are. Are they ameliorating climate? Again, I can guarantee you they are, but we don't have quantitative data to prove it. 
There are socioeconomic aspects, barriers and successful approaches to adoption. Why isn't more adoption happening, for example? What are some of the effects in communities where a lot of this is happening, like the Dunbar Spring neighborhood? It's, it's beginning to affect property values in that neighborhood. What is the cultural importance of food forests and uses? We're in a multicultural region. We have the Native American culture, we have the Hispanic culture. Um, what is the cultural importance to the very different groups we have in this region? How do they use or develop food forests differently? And then some, some wrap up conclusions here. Food forests are definitely possible, even in this hot, dry, southwest climate environment we're in here. There's great examples that show it can be done. Most food forests have a supplemental water source. It might be city water, ditch water, something like that, but some use only rainwater, collected in cisterns normally, and with swales. Food forests appear to be growing in number, and I think it's partly those promoters and those networks that I just talked about very, very briefly. They can clearly address that urban heat island effect, which is already very significant in this region, but might become more significant over time. Food forests can promote both biodiversity and agro biodiversity. When you go into one of these really well-developed food forests, they're alive with birds and insects, um, a lot of biological diversity. And with design, you can bring in heritage crops, older varieties, you can bring in all kinds of different agro-biodiversity elements. Food forests can be a great community building activity. And the best example I've seen so far is that Dunbar Spring neighborhood, where it really is impacting the community as a whole. And I'll show you a couple of pictures here to illustrate that. So these are images from that, that neighborhood. And when I say community building, one of, one of the attributes you see is a lot of artwork, promoting the neighborhood, showing pride in the neighborhood, big sculptures that kids can play on, murals. There are a few places that are designed for people to sit and talk to each other. These are three permanently in place stools. But the only way you can sit on these stools is to face the way the three of us are facing here. It's designed to have people sit down and talk. You've got little shared libraries. All these things have developed after Brad moved into this neighborhood, started planting. So it was about food forests, about urban forestry, and it's about community development. And to me, this is the finest example in the Southwest of that community development aspect. And again, if you're interested to see this in person, come to our Southwest Agroforestry Action Network meeting in mid-March of next year. And so with that, I'm gonna just open it up and see if anybody has any questions. I do see one question there. And Andrew, would you mind emailing me offline because I, I didn't get a hold of the individual in time to ask permission uh, to, to name her to, or to give contact information. I do believe she would give it, but I don't want to just give it right now until I know I have permission to do so because it is a private property. But she does do tours occasionally there. She, she did a tour for our Southwest Agroforestry Action Network. So I think I'll be able to give you the name and probably even some of the PDFs that I have that she developed. But, but let me do that after the fact, once I've gotten permission from her. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for participating. Um, as Jim mentioned, we're, we've got time for questions and, uh, and some, some discussion here. So um, what I'm gonna do is uh, just point your attention to, uh, if you move your cursor around, you can find a menu pop up and you'll see the chat box. Make sure you click on that chat box and it'll pop open and you can just, uh, write any questions there at the bottom of the screen you'll see a dialogue box where you can uh, write any of your questions and uh, so as those questions come in Jim uh, we'll we'll try to review them but perhaps I'll start off with a, a question sure. um, or maybe I'm going to start off with a comment uh, Jim and, and just put things in context I absolutely concur with you uh, food Forest uh, gardens are absolutely a, a main agroforestry practice. In fact, I have to be honest here, in, in my own perspective, I really am uncomfortable talking about the the five 
uh, forestry practices. Uh, I like to think them as the main tempered agroforestry practices okay. and uh, and not the only ones. And 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 for many years have considered forest gardens uh, or food forest as a you know, a pillar or principle a temperate agroforestry practice. So at least six of main agroforestry practices. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, a question while we wait for some of the uh, participants' uh, questions to come in. Um, the site we saw where they did some wonderful work uh, along that right away and things really developed organically and just beautifully and it fostered a lot of community uh, involvement. I just wanted to ask about, uh, now, as a right-of-way, uh, is there some concern that it, it technically that the city or the utilities or uh, companies who has that right-of-way, you know, that could uh, any day just sort of say, well, we, we need to widen the street or do this and, and, and it's over. Uh, is that any consideration? Uh, I don't know about widening the streets because the streets are already really wide. And yeah. I didn't mention it, but they've put in on the streets themselves two, two kinds of structures. In the intersections, several of them, they have traffic circles now. And inside those circles, they have little mini food forests. Nice. Right in the middle of the intersection yeah. and artwork. And then they have what are called chicanes, which stick out into the street here and there and slow traffic. They call them traffic calming chicanes. Mm. But, but yeah, the, the right of way, you know, in talking to Brad when we visited him, uh, there are some issues. They had to get city permission. Uh, occasionally the city comes in in an uninformed way and like cuts some of their trees or prunes them the wrong way or mm -hmm. you know, there's some challenges. Originally when they did those curb cuts, they were illegal in this city of Tucson. Right. Uh, but now they're actually promoted more widely in the city. Uh, so if you talk to Brad and you know, if anybody who comes to our meeting down there will get that story from him, I'm sure. There definitely have been issues over the years with the city and it, it took a while to get the city as fully on board as they are now because they seem to be actively promoting this well beyond his neighborhood now. Uh-huh. Right. Um, Thanks. So it's really exciting to see that. Interesting. So yes, it's it's it has some some uh challenges, but it sounds like it's been entirely manageable and not something that would has diminished their progress or is an overly yeah. concern. Yeah. Um uh, folks who are still with us, if you have some questions, please, I, or any any thoughts, please, I encourage you to open up uh, the chat box and shoot a question or comment. Um, uh, if that is uh, somehow not finding that, you might try to unmute your mic and, and or raise your hand, and, and I'll try to unmute your mic. But uh, please send us your questions or comments through the chat box. Uh, maybe I'll continue, uh, Jim. Uh, yeah, I found it really fascinating. Uh, in some cases, uh, this intersection then with the the, the agroecology and the sustainable green building uh, that some of these sites had, and and some uh, almost a a, a a a very good or, or melting away the the, the barriers or, or, or frontier between inside and outside space in in in, in some of this this design that are going on. I just found it fascinating. That's more of a yeah. comment than a question. <laughs> well, the, a really great example is up there at the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute, where one of the greenhouses is attached to the house. And so it can help warm the house in the winter. You, know, you can walk right from the house into the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. That house, that greenhouse is, is the one that Jerome calls his Mediterranean greenhouse. It's uh, dominated by a giant fig tree and a fair number of other plants as well. Good. And then the, oh. greenhouse, the tropical yeah. greenhouse has a sauna in it. You know, it's, it's really quite fascinating. Yeah. And then um, I guess what that might tell us uh, or inform us in, for future design and, and planning, systems planning, when taking it beyond the private space and into the public space, you know, can, can public buildings uh, begin to embrace some of these design, uh, ecological design considerations and have uh, this kind of, uh, integration of indoor outdoor space in in, a, in, in sustainable ways um, there well we do have some questions coming in Jim I don't know if you can see them the first from uh, Rich Shockey who asks um, well how much food is provided and what about the quality of food yeah well that to, I have yet to see research on the quantity that is produced and I think that's a, gr a great area for research 
I did see a recent paper on the quantity produced in a food forest in England. It was really fascinating because uh, they measured for like eight years everything that was produced. But I haven't seen anything like that in the Southwest. I will tell you though, those four four days I spent at Jerome's place, I don't think I've ever eaten better meals. <laughs> the food was fresh, there were fresh eggs, it was just beautiful quality food. Mm. You, you could walk through that path. You, this is a picture you're looking at right now of uh, <laughs> Jerome's uh, food forest. You can just walk through, pick an apple, pick mulberries, pick currants, you know, whatever is in season right off the plant. It's just quite amazing quality of food. Yeah. And so that, uh, the next question is really on a, on a similar uh, theme there, Jim, and, and it's from Maria Hetman. She asks about food production and, and examples. Uh, and do we know much about uh, the food produced? But then she then goes on to ask about the distribution and, and in community food forests and shared areas, is there any methodology to how the food products are distributed? Yeah. The, you know, a, a better resource would be Kathy Bukowski and that book, Community Food Forest. But yeah. I can tell you just a little bit about what goes on down in Phoenix, I mean, in Tucson, where they, you know, do have a community effort there. They, um, they have collections, group collections of like the mesquite pods when they're in season, all through that dispersed neighborhood. And they have a processing facility they use, and they do like a community pancake breakfast. So they have mesquite pancakes with prickly pure syrup and uh, some of the other Sonoran plants are featured as well. And so that's kind of a community celebration of what they're doing. Uh, down there, they also have a, an organization that does gleaning all through the city of Tucson. So that's kind of a, not directly related to food forests, but they glean food all through the city. People's fruit trees in their backyards are not using, things like that. And then they make that available through uh, food banks and other means. Mm. So there, there is some formalized sharing going on, mainly in Tucson that I'm more uh, in Phoenix. Uh, there might be, I'm just not aware of it in Phoenix. Mm. But that yeah, Phoenix, thanks for that. Uh, uh, I, I should, uh, uh, I'll follow up Maria Hetman's other question is about whether to get a copy of this presentation. I should mention that this webinar and all webinars in our series are recorded and are available for on-demand viewing uh, through our website. And I imagine, Maria, that uh, if Jim's amenable, we could uh, provide a, a PDF of, of the presentation as well. Um, yeah, and to that. Uh, address Donna's question. Uh, Donna, I'm pretty sure you're there in Colorado that you folks interested would be invited, I'm, I'm assuming, to the March meeting in, in Tucson for the, for the network. Is that right, Jim? Yes. Uh, is that Donna Davis or is that? I, I believe that must be Donna Davis. Okay. Donna, I, th I think, I want to say you're on our SWAN mailing list and you'll get a save the date notice here pretty shortly. But if not, you know, just email me. I'd be happy to give you more details on that. Good, we're, good. we're putting the final touches on the on the program and going to get the word out here very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, following, moving on, Andrew Langford's uh, question from, uh, he's in, in California and asks about uh, these seem to like, like private initiatives or privately resourced individuals. Uh, but what about our colleges and, and our agriculture colleges are, and are there any doing some work? And he asks, how come our ag colleges are not generally leading this movement? I don't know of many schools, uh, but Virginia Tech certainly, I think, has been involved. But the University of Massachusetts, I'm aware of, has a very strong food systems program and has a uh, uh, food forest uh, that it, uh, you know, officially supports around the, the, the college and that goes into uh, some of their food services. How about you, Jim? Do you know of any universities that are uh, yeah. leading the charge here? Well, yes and no. There we, we had our first in-person meeting of the Southwest Agroforestry Action Network in Farmington for a pretty specific reason, and that was related to the New Mexico State people that are up there at that agricultural research facility they have that are doing agroforestry-related work. It's not food forest-related work, it's more general agroforestry, and it's really about some of the species that could be brought into an ag agroforestry system. And there are several other research stations in New Mexico affiliated with New Mexico State that are doing things that are relevant, like research on jujube or things like that. But I've yet to see a food forest on a university setting. Here at NAU, we have a sustainable garden that's kind of like a food forest. But um, yeah, the universities in this region aren't leading the charge very aggressively. And that, mm. that's partly why I got involved. I saw that 
we there was a niche there that needed to be filled because <laughs> hmm. we're not well, the land grant we're not the ag school here at northern arizona university right and it, it, if you see andrew's other comment and he says you know this forest garden approach needs to be central to the green new deal who's working on that that's uh, a good point so uh, getting agroforestry and, and agroforestry practices front and center on some of the uh climate uh, uh change or or, or um or uh, carbon uh, uh, legislation. Um, but uh, moving on, uh, 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 Catherine Bilanowski uh, mentions that she's gonna be giving a class. Yeah, we're in touch with Catherine from the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. You mentioned Hannah. And yeah, we'll uh, help you try to get uh, any of the resources that might be useful for that, that class. Uh, so I'll follow up with you after that. Um, Jim, as we approach the hour here, uh, you want to try uh, maybe one of the final questions there? How about uh, um, the final question there that asked about uh, publications or any articles that you or others have uh, published on food forests uh, based on this or other research? Uh, just a couple of short articles to date, for example, in the uh, Association for Temperate Agroforestry newsletter. but. Just this morning, John Munsell sent me a draft of a chapter for this new book on agroforestry, temporary agroforestry, that will include a chapter on urban agroforestry, you know, primarily focused on food forests. And so that chapter is in development for that book, which is in development and will come out probably early next year, hopefully. So there is a much more extensive chapter. It's not focused specifically on the Southwest, uh, but that is something I've been involved as a co-author on. Um, I would like to write up an article based on the surveys that I've done to date. They're relatively informal, but I think there are outlets that would be good for it still. Maybe this will encourage me to, to get on that. Um, gosh, uh, following up on that, uh, I think, uh, you know, Catherine Bukowski and, and, uh, and her colleagues at Virginia Tech have, in addition to the book, have published some articles, I, I believe. Um, so perhaps, uh, I, I don't quite get the name from their high high one, but if if you want to follow up by email, and we'll see if we can't uh, put together some leads on some uh, uh, background literature on, on the topic. Yeah, there there definitely is an emerging literature, not very specific to the Southwest for the most part, but uh, clearly an emerging literature on food forests, which is great to see. Hey, uh, Jim, do we want to go out with one uh, that one final question? Um, consideration on funding, Andrew Langford again. Just following up and asking is if the USDA is funding any of this kind of work or who what other public sector resources would support is or could be supporting some of this work yeah that, that's a, a good question because what I'm seeing is not a lot of public funding going for these small private food forests mm. you know we were standing in one the, the one in Farmington uh, I was standing in it with an NRCS employee and I said, hey, you know, is this the kind of thing that you guys are funding here in New Mexico? And he said, no, I don't think so. If, if you look though, multi-strata agroforestry is, is one of the practices that NRCS says it will fund in many yeah. states. And um, so it's on the books as something that is fundable, right? but it's not a traditional sort of thing, especially these quarter acre, half acre back lots and cities. I don't think that's mm. what NRCS is that used to uh, supporting and frankly you don't need a whole lot of support to do one of these privately in your backyard I mean there is some investment for sure but a lot of people can afford to do this on their own in the yeah, reservation. probably more more of a question of time and effort than cost um, I, I guess maybe following up on that comment uh, Jim yeah the multi strata agroforestry is a recognized uh, uh, technical standard or uh, standard practice for NRCS, but I imagine very few states, their technical committee have actually adopted that practice. Yeah. That's something we should look at and see if, uh, how many states have actually, technical committees actually adopted that practice. Because otherwise, you know, there, there wouldn't be allocation of funds in that state for that practice, right. if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to look around other uh, USDA or other uh, programs but I imagine, you know, this food forest, you know, it has a, quite an intersection between community development and, and health and nutrition. Yeah. There could be other sources of funding from uh, either U, other USDA or other agency or other community type yeah. resources. Uh, the example of the Giving Grove in Kansas City, they've done wonderful work with uh, promoting uh, 
uh, community orchards around uh, the city, uh, around on mostly on abandoned land and getting a lot of community involvement. They come from a church background, if I'm not mistaken, so they've been able to mobilize some of that energy. Yeah. But they're, you know, they're taking their model now uh, in partnerships to other uh, urban ag activities in other cities. So, um, yeah. well, that's what's happening in Tucson. That that neighborhood I talked about briefly. That's yeah. that place has gotten a lot of funding from the city, from uh, the state forestry department. So that's an example where they have gotten money and it's primarily from those kind of sources that you just listed. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so yeah, if, if it's a more community oriented project, there's definitely pools of money you can tap into. Right. For sure. Well, uh, Jim, I think we've uh, addressed, if not all, most of the questions there. And I think we've had a decent, uh, good discussion. So I thank you for, for uh, putting the time and effort in, into this and, and, and also to all the participants who joined us and those who have stayed with us for the discussion. I think that brings us to the end of the, the, the presentation. So once again, thank you to, to all. Um, do, do, ch do check in at the Center for Agroforestry website and see the uh, uh, future web, uh, webinars that are scheduled and our other resources on the Center for Agroforestry.org website. I should mention our next webinar, uh, I believe, is on November 6th, and that will be with Gary Bentrup. And, and uh, another co-author from the U.S. Forest Service looking at high-resolution mapping of forests, uh, sorry, trees outside of forests. But you can get the exact details through the Center for Agroforestry.org. That's our website. And click on the webinar link to get full details of future webinars. This webinar has been recorded, as are all webinars in our series. And you can find the links to view them uh, through the Center for Agroforestry.org website. Thank you so much. See you next time. All right, thank you, Gregory.